Hello and welcome. My name is Jo Swaffield and I'm head of the Department of Economics and Related Studies here at the University of York. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our event today with Professor Linda Scott presenting the Double X Economy, which is part of the University of York's online open lecture series. Although in a different format, our open lectures continue to aim to enhance York's reputation as a city of ideas and innovation through offering the highest caliber of public events. So welcome again, wherever you are in the world, and thank you for joining us today. A few technical notes before we begin though. If you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen. This is available throughout the talk. Should you have technical issues such as the loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. Subtitles are available during this event. To turn these on or off, use the CC Live Transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch again later if you'd like to. So now, to introduce our speaker, and it is a real pleasure to introduce Professor Linda Scott. Linda is Emeritus DP World Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of Oxford, founder of the PowerShift Forum for Women in the World Economy, Senior Consulting Fellow at Chatham House and Consultant to the World Bank Group on Gender Economics, and also Visiting Professor at Brown University. For more than 15 years, Linda has played a central role in the rise of the Women's Economic Empowerment Movement, a coalition of activists, multinational corporations, global NGOs and governments coming together in response to emerging national level data sets that demonstrate economic gender inequality is a worldwide problem with a distinctive pattern in every country. This evening, Linda will be talking with us about her new book, The Double X Economy, The Epic Potential of Women's Empowerment, a book that provides a deeply researched and powerful argument on the potential of women's empowerment and how such empowerment presents a benefit to us all, not just women. An argument that details women's systematic exclusion from economic participation and equality that has created an alternate economy, the double X economy. Linda's analysis shows that severe exclusions have been applied throughout history and have shaped women's economic opportunities and outcomes. Economic activity, which if empowered, tends to be more careful, cooperative, and more focused on positive long-term outcomes than the current economic order. Also, the double X economy is not only a detailed and rigorous analysis of women's economic position, it is also a call to action to us all. So during the week of International Women's Day, can I please let now welcome Professor Linda Scott. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'd like to begin um, by defining and explaining the concept of the double X economy, because if you haven't read the book, it's not immediately evident what it, what it is. And I think that it's easiest to understand by analogy to things we're used to talking about, like the informal economy or the underground economy or the gig economy. It is uh, the economy of women. It is an economy that like those others um, is somewhat invisible. And it is typified by certain products and practices and uh, customers and constraints well, customers and finances. Um, the most important thing about it for our purposes is that it has certain mechanisms that act as constraints and that these constraints in turn produce a pattern of inequality. The constraints and the pattern of inequality are the same all over the world. So it begs the question then, how did this happen, right? And one of the things, because a pattern like that all over the world demands an explanation that is either that it's cultural, which we have all been taught to think, or it is natural, which feminists in particular don't like to think. So one of the things that this book does is to go deeply into both of those questions. And without going into too much detail here, although I'll be happy to answer questions about it later, what I've concluded is that the science simply does not support a statement that says this is natural. Um, it's too inconclusive. It's uh, too, um, there's equally good uh, arguments to be made that humans were originally female dominant or male dominant. Um, and that the cultural, um, the cultural explanation that we're so used to hearing for gender inequality um, is normally allows, makes us think that it would be 
idiosyncratic what the gender norms would be from place to place. And what these data show is that in fact, um, it's the same everywhere. Um, and I think it also helps if I tell you a little bit about this discovery story behind this uh, concept. Um, it began when I was writing a history of the rise of American feminism in connection to the rise of the modern economy in the United States, uh, in particular, actually, the beauty and fashion economy. And I felt like I learned some things by doing that research that suggested there were uh, practical interventions that could be done on behalf of women in the developing world that would both give them more freedom and help their li livelihoods. Um, and when I started doing that work, what I found was is that there was a consistent list of mechanisms that were constraining them and that were causing them to be unequal. And that as I went around the world doing these projects, I found the same mechanisms everywhere. Now, it echoed a bit to me because I had done the history research and I knew that these constraints were virtually the same as what had been uh, the norm in the United States and also in the United Kingdom and eventually around the world. I eventually discovered around the world. And um, at the same time, uh, we started having, uh, oh, I should also say, and I was teaching at Oxford uh, in the business school. So I was also exposed to a lot of elite women who were in business. And what I was finding there was that the same constraints were operative there in a slightly um, softened form, but still there. Um, at the same time, we started getting large international data sets coming out uh, through, for example, the World Economic Forum, uh, the World Bank, and other international agencies that for the first time gave shape and quantification to women's economic situation. And what these data consistently showed, in fact, was that all of them had the same pattern of inequality. And as we worked on it, we, the group of uh, people around the world who, who uh, emerged to study this question, uh, we found that um, it was all held in place, again, by the same constraints. What this data also showed was that even though most of us um, had come to think of uh, women's um, contribution to the economy as being somewhat trivial or, you know, not, not the main show, um, that in fact, the women's economy was enormous. Um, women contribute about 40% of GDP globally. They contribute more than half of the food supply. Uh, to give you some sense of the dimension, if the women in the United States decided to form their own nation, they would immediately have an economy big enough to join the G7. So this in turn raises all kinds of questions about how this happened. And it has a lot to do with the fact that since the middle 20th century, we have only counted as economic activity, the things that, are, uh, that involve exchange of money. And um, we have also only measured it by household. And that meant that women's contribution was frequently unrecorded or undifferentiated. Now, what this data also showed eventually was that, um, that the, and you can kind of predict this because it's a, a very large group, um, that, the, uh, that, that the women's economy had a very large impact and in particular that gender inequality had a very large negative impact in many ways around the world. And I wanna start by showing you one of our first discoveries. And so Martin, would you mind putting up that, putting up that first slide, please? Okay, so what you have here is a graph of women's economic empowerment and gross domestic product, GDP, which is basically national income. Um, along the bottom, the Women's Economic Empowerment uh, Index is a, a measurement, a composite a measurement calculated by the Economist Intelligence Unit. And it, it covers, as most of these indices do, uh, things like women's labor force participation, um, but also various things like rights of mobility, their health status, their education, and things like that. It's, it's very broad. And then along the left, you have GDP per capita. And so what this, this uh, graph shows us is that as nations, when nations have a higher uh, women's economic empowerment, they also have higher GDP. And this has been demonstrated many times. Um, Martin, you can take this down now. 
And over time, we have come to understand what the mechanism is behind this. And at first, people said, oh, well, you know, the, the, the rich nations uh, could afford the luxury of, of letting their women be free, and that the um, poor nations uh, could not because they had to focus on survival. And of course, the presumption there is that male dominance helps survival. And what we found instead over time is that, first of all, it's not that the rich nations had the luxury of setting their women free. It's that setting their women free made them rich. And that male dominance in developing countries contributes mightily to instability and poverty and hunger and violence in those countries. And that as long as gender inequality prevails, they will continue to be that way. So you can see then that this is that the stakes are quite high here. Uh, it is amazing to me that this phenomenon doesn't hasn't already gotten more attention, because this is something where we have hard evidence, lots of it, that say that if we could eliminate gender inequality from the world, everybody on the planet would benefit in multiple ways, that we would all be better off, but we also would eliminate a lot of really tragic forms of human suffering. So let me go on here and show you a little bit more about the about why this is and, and what it is. Um, it's important to understand that none of this has to do with women being weak or women making bad decisions. And uh, but instead, this is a structural inequality. And here's a good example of what I mean by structural. Martin, would you put the second slide on, please? OK, so what you're seeing here is a global land holding by sex. And um, on the vertical axis, what you have is the percent of individuals holding land in each country. And then if they're male, it's a black dot. And if they're female, it's a red dot. And this is the data for 106 developed and developing countries. And you can tell at a glance that, um, that there's a huge inequality here and that it is consistent across the, across the globe. And that more or less what we see is that 80% of landholders on average are men and under 20% are women. Now, this is, this is really too strong a pattern to um, dismiss as, uh, as uh, random. And it doesn't make any sense to suggest that this was done out of choice, that women self-selected into landlessness. Because over time, uh, holding land has been the source of wealth and capital and power in human history. And so you really have to be um, uh, dismissive of women's intelligence and self-determination to think they would have just chosen to be uh, impoverished. Um, okay, so if you wanna take that away now. Now, what happens over time then is that because uh, land is the, is the main store of capital, um, it means that over time, this advantage on the part of males uh, having own, owned capital, own, own land, eventually, even in the developed nations, we see that they also control about that percent of capital in terms of investments and so forth. So now, how did this happen? Um, we, we, I've said it's structural. I've said it's not random. I've said it's not by choice. So I, I went into history to see um, where it had started. And what I found was that all over the world, most cultures, in fact, by far most cultures, had, had not allowed women to own land and had uh, customs and laws that, uh, that dictated that, that land could only go from male to male. And this is true regardless of whether those laws were written down. It's true regardless of whether it's a modern society or uh, and, uh, a, a um, hunter-gatherer society. And the very first laws that we have that are written, uh, the Code of ur -Namu, which is about 2000 BCE, shows it. And you can see it then through the next, uh, the next few um, sets of laws. So it's very ancient. Um, and it has been held in place until, for women in the West, until the middle of the 20th century um, and, uh, and in the rest of the world still today. What this does then in turn is because the, the downside of it is, is that because women don't hold as much land, they don't have the capital to develop it because they, in most of the developing world, you have to have land in order to get credit and investment. That means then that they don't develop their land and don't have the higher yields that men do. 
And there's been research to show that if they did have access to those resources, they would have uh, the same yield that men do. And this means that agricultural economies, which is what most poor countries are, would have higher GDP if they leveled this playing field. But it goes further than that because, um, because then those countries don't produce as much food, it leads to a food security problem. And which of course uh, leads to all kinds of strife and instability, but it also means people go hungry. And the United Nations says that in fact, if we did this one thing, equalize this one thing between men and women, we would be able to feed 150 million of the world's chronically hungry. So this is the way in which we find that gender inequality is a structural thing. It leads to lower GDP, but it also leads to really serious and widespread suffering. Um, however, you can also see, I think, that, um, that if it's the case that women didn't own land and couldn't get capital and couldn't produce as much as the men, that eventually um, it might be that the argument was made that they were simply worth less than men. And to justify uh, all of the things that held them down, you would start to hear, you know, things like we do see in the world religions like that they don't, women don't have souls or that women can't go to heaven or that women are simply have worse brains than men do or something like that. And it, it evolves into today around the world, a general, a general feeling and prejudice that women simply are worth less. And so we see this, for example, uh, manifest in the fact that their labor is um, unpaid in the home. Uh, we see it in terms of um, the source of human trafficking. Right now, uh, slavery is bigger than it has ever been in world history, and 71% of all slaves are female. Uh, and they are largely pulled into slavery because of their economic vulnerability. We also see over time, um, beginning with prehistoric societies and hunter-gatherer societies, that women have been, females in general, have been fed less than men. And we can document that through, for example, the, the records left behind their teeth and their bones. Um, and so the unequal out access to material resources has been right down to things like food, very basic things like food, and all the way up today to pay. And in fact, it's, more, it's really more accurate to think of women's economic exclusion rather than their economic inequality and it's not right to think of it as uh, they're being excluded from formal employment. It's much more accurate to say, for example, that they've been excluded from the money system entirely because many of the constraints are aimed at keeping them cashless, basically. Um, if you could give me that one more uh, slide, please, Martin. The one with the bars that are up and down. So what this is, is that this is a measurement of the gender gap in pay that's collected every year by the World Economic Forum. And the red bars going up and down represent um, uh, 132 countries. And the question that is asked is, what are women paid on customarily in your country um, for similar work as compared to men? So what that means is that the black bar at the top is 100, and it's at that, at that point, women would be paid customarily for the same work, um, the same as men. And you can see that none of the red bars even come close to touching that 100 mark. And what that tells us that as a customary practice, as a rule of thumb around the world, women simply are not paid as much as men. It's not thought to be appropriate to pay them as much as men. And that is true in every single country for which we have data. So we can, you can take that back then, Martin, that one back. Um, so what we also find then is that we find that um, various things are used um, as uh, justifications. And so for instance, to justify, um, to explain rather the equal pay, uh, the gender pay gap we hear, and it's, it is true statistically speaking, that it comes from women not advancing as fast or as much as men do. It comes from clustering in certain low paid industries. And it also comes from the choice to have children. Um, and in fact, this is such a demonstrable and widespread phenomenon that employers punish women uh, for having children that it has a name. It's called the motherhood penalty. And unfortunately, the motherhood penalty, in addition to being unjust and economically damaging, 
um, is also at this point producing a, a very unfortunate um, pattern in terms of fertility. Now, I think most people think that the, that the world has a population explosion problem. And in fact, we don't have that problem. Um, we ha there are about half the countries in the world have what you might call excess fertility. And fertility is defined as the number of women, your average, the number of children an average woman has over the course of her life. Um, and so in those countries, women might have four plus children at this point because the fertility rate is declining uh, because of access to contra uh, contraceptions and stuff. In the rest of the world, about half, uh, instead countries are experience, experiencing such a rapid decline in fertility that many, if not most of them, are to the point where they are under the level by which they can replace their populations. And some of them, for example, in the European Union, they are now at or below uh, the fertility rate that they can ever come back again, uh, what demographers call the point of no return. Um, and I just want to be able to show you this very last slide, Martin, just so that you can see what this looks like on a global scale. Yeah. Okay, so the very dark countries indicate low fertility and the very light countries show high fertility. So you can see that at this point, the global pattern is low fertility, not high fertility, and that you can very much identify the places where high fertility is a problem. Now, it is also the case that high fertility uh, goes along with, occurs, co-occurs with low gender um, equality. Uh, where these are places where women have very little, very few rights and have in fact no sovereignty over their own bodies. Um, and that in, in addition, those countries tend to be conflict regions. And that is because of the uh, extreme male dominance, which leads them to be very violent and also uh, leads them to commit uh, rape against the women to the point where you have these fertility issues. And, um, and they become very fragile and unstable states um, and therefore become really a threat to the whole world. Uh, we can go back now, uh, that's all the slides. In the, in the Western nations, um, the, uh, the declining fertility is also contributing to a very scary problem and that's the aging of populations. Um, we think that the aging population is due to the fact that we have greater longevity now, and that is to some extent true. But the main contributor is the fact that women have not been having enough babies to replace the population. And so as a result, we are having uh, these, um, these uh, very dramatic shifts to where you're going to be having over the next 10 to 20 years and perhaps longer, a very lopsided population where uh, you're going to have a lot of people in the older group who are going to have to be supported with social services and the like, and that this is going to cost a lot in taxes. And at the same time, your labor supply is going to be diminishing, which will in turn um, rob savings, reduce the consumer market. It's, it's going to be an economic train wreck. And this is all happening because of the willingness simply to treat women unfairly. So you can see again that these things have uh, a very wide reach and a very serious reach. So in closing, what I've tried to tell you here today is that this is a very different view of the economy uh, than what we're taught in Economics 101, uh, but it's very important and it, has a ten it tends to call into question whether the basic theories of e economics that we have been taught have any validity whatsoever because they don't apply to more than half of the, of the world's population's economic behavior. Um, it also um, raises questions about feminism, what the, what the source is of women's subordination and therefore what the best ways to fight that subordination would be and to eliminate gender inequality. Uh, one of the things that I do a lot in the book, there's not really time to do today, is to describe to you some of the practical solutions that have already been tested in the world. Uh, there are interventions that can be made that we have learned work um, and uh, can bring women out of economic inequality in a way that produces positive outcomes enough that it's acceptable to communities. This is giving us a, a lot of hope. There is, it, as grim as this picture is, it also, because we now know what it looks like and we are starting to know what to do, uh, 
it gives us a lot of hope and the hope is pretty broad because this is something that if that shows us how to troubleshoot a number of world problems in addition to gender inequality. So uh, as Joe said in the beginning, uh, basically this book is as much as anything a recruitment brochure. Um, and what I'm hoping is that people who read it or who hear, hear me speak will join with this cause and take on some of the next steps that I outline in the book. So Joe, would you care to rejoin me at this point? Hi, Linda. Hi, thank you very much for that. Hi. So we've got a few questions in the question box. Um, so I can go to those um, there. So that there seem to be a couple of questions around land and the importance of land, because you make an important point about the importance of land in terms of um, economic activity. So I had a very nice question from uh, an audience member, Florian, who says, what policies can be put in place to rebalance the ownership of land? Okay, so um, there's a lot of activity on this uh, in the developing world um, where uh, there are drives to, for example, um, get women uh, registered on land title, uh, uh, even in joint uh, ownership, uh, and sometimes to use the economic, economic benefits that come from some of the other programs to purchase land and register it. Um, a great deal of this um, problem right now does come from the fact that the women don't know they can own land. Um, and withholding important information like that is also very typical of the double X economy. It is kind of a problem in the developed world, to be honest, because it's very entrenched. Uh, in, in England, for example, in Great Britain, it's um, only 13.7% of women uh, of land is held by women. Uh, and that's, that's really quite shocking. Uh, in the Netherlands, it's only 6%, which is comparable to some of the most conservative countries in the Middle East. Um, and the question becomes, so how do you unlock that? Um, to some degree, there is a start made on changes of inheritance laws, um, such that women uh, now can inherit and more and more in the Western nations, there's an expectation that if the man dies, his estate will go to the wife and that the wife in turn will dispense of the assets upon her death to the children. And this is very much more the norm and also the default if there is no will. This over time will um, uh, even that out, but it'll take a while. Um, there are programs um, that are intended to do things like um, increase the investment funds available for women-owned businesses. Um, these are fairly small and we can talk some more about the details of those, but it's, a, it's coming at it the other way from the capital rather than from the land. Interesting, one of the things that is, I'm sure most people won't think of, um, uh, I actually wrote a blog on this uh, just last week about um, the peerage. Uh, in England, where you have a situation, it's what we call an international policy, sun preference, and sun preference is a very negative term. Uh, they call it in uh, primogeniture in, in the United Kingdom, and the period still operates on uh, sun preference, which is just abhorrent in a, in a modern society. If you were to change that, okay, you would be able to look at redistributing eventually about a third of the land in England. That's a big chunk. Uh, and that is something that would probably have pretty good impact pretty quickly. So those are some of the things. Thank you. Um, there's, uh, there's a related question on the land, so I'll ask it because it's in the Q&A. Um, so um, I think the question was posed in relation to your comments about the distribution of land and the comment that it was unfairly distributed. And the question is, why is this distribution um, not because women, why, is, why isn't it a result of the fact women are not very good at farming and have physical limitations to farming? So I guess yeah. the suggestion is the, the observed distribution is an optimal distribution given different ability of farming capabilities. Okay. I think that's So it's, it's always um, a, a very quick response. Um, I get this a lot and um, even not with regard to the book uh, to say, well, it must be something the women are doing. So this is a very sort of automatic response that it is, um, we need to blame the women. They've, they've clearly done something wrong here. Um, but as I, I, I alluded during the talk, the evidence doesn't support that, um, that idea. Um, we have studies that already, large scale studies that show that if you uh, intervene to equalize that situation, the women produce as much as the men. 
Uh, and it's also the case that in history, people don't realize this, um, that there's this whole myth that floats around that the reason women are uh, unequal is because they couldn't plow when the plow was invented. And it's just simply not true. Uh, throughout history, when men went off to war and sometimes didn't come back, the women plowed. Okay, you can even look at, at uh, recruitment posters from Britain in both world wars that show women plowing during the war effort. So it is just, just flatly not true. And, um, and so in this particular instance, we, we really can't say that. And in any case, even if we could, we wouldn't know because women have never owned land, full stop. So we just don't know. Okay, thank you. Okay, I've got a nice set of questions coming in related to fertility. So just one question, just in terms of um, definitions, um, uh, an audience member asks, is the high fertility the capability of women to have babies or the number of babies a woman, a woman has? Okay, in this case, in this case, we might say there's a medical definition and there's a demographic definition. Okay, so we talk about fertility of both males and females in terms of the ability, the capacity or lack thereof. Okay, in the case of demography, it's a very specific definition and it's the number of children the average woman has in her lifetime. All right, so what that means, it's, it's, a, it's a generational measure. It takes a long time in the making and a long time to go away. So for example, in my mother's generation, um, people had on average three or four children, but it took a long time coming to my generation where they only had an average of two to drop down. And we're still just below two in, mo in like the United uh, Kingdom, the United States, for instance, even though uh, the millennials, for example, are probably gonna be all the way down to one, all right? And by the time you get to Gen Z, it will probably be an average of one. Um, and so that's what it does is it, it just, it, it's like a rolling average that moves through time measuring what, how many children on average women have at that time. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I've got a question relating to the Nordic countries. So the, the comment is Nordic countries have good gender equality. Uh, why, why is the fertility so low? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, which, what kind of countries? I'm not hearing you, it's a bit muddy. Sorry, Nordic. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, so the Nordic countries um, usually uh, rate very high when people do these women's economic and, and, and gender equality indices. And they usually are up at the top. And a lot of that is because they have high labor force participation and they have closer uh, equal pay um, on a bunch of measures. Um, but it's important to understand that the measures that we use for that were initially the data was collected for the purpose of poverty fighting. And so these are human development indicators. And so the, it's set up so that the Western countries started at the top of the scale. Okay, and the things, and there's like a ceiling effect that happens. And the kinds of things that you get in the Nordic countries are not measured. Okay, so you do have declining fertility rates in those, in those countries. And that's because there actually is a much more subtle thing that goes on there about whether women choose to have children, even though the childcare is provided, because they're, the childcare being provided still puts sort of pressure on them to have children that they then have to choose to be in the labor force or not. You also don't have in the Nordic countries the development of services that we know are really important, like house cleaning services, right? And these are really important to the ability of, of women to work. It's also emerging that there are some violence problems in the Nordic countries that are not being measured and they're not look, they're looking kind of scary. Uh, and that there's also a bifurcation of the uh, economic situation where you have women doing quite well in the government, but not in the private sector. And that the private sector has remained very male dominant and rather unfriendly to women. So, there's more there than meets the eye. And I have to say, I get a little bit fed up sometimes with, with some of the Scandinavians because they're so, oh, we've, we've got this whipped. And um, yeah, I think they've been reading their own press. Um, there, there, is not, there is not a country in the world that has solved their gender problem. Yeah. And I have quite a sort of related question from Emily who says um, that that sort of correlation between um, high gender equality and high fertility rates, and then of course, 
uh, well, low gender inequality and low fertility rates, whether that's a problem. So the question actually is, do you think the trend of high gender inequality, meaning high fertility, causes a big issue for the future of gender equality, as if a low gender inequality means a low fertility rate? So I yeah. guess right okay so if you were going to a higher fertility rate and and of course it you know it trades off like if 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 the western countries were to eliminate the motherhood penalty get serious for once about enforcing their equality laws which they have not been okay uh they would probably experience a rise in fertility germany for example has finally enacted some child care supports that have started to to lift theirs a bit it's a bit it's a bit too early to say okay but in the developing world, if you've got a high level of fertility and it starts to suddenly run up again, it usually is accompanied by uh, a, an eruption of conflict. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a high, there's a lot of motivation for international agencies and governments to get involved to stop that conflict. Uh, and on an ongoing basis, there's a lot of uh, motivation for NGOs and governments to try to keep the fertility down. Um, and so, and the hope is that over time, and actually the trend does show over time that those countries fertility rates will come down. And if we didn't see that, it would be, it, you know, it would be, it is when it happens, a cause for alarm. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, no, that's good. And I think uh, following sort of related to that um, is essentially sort of a, a comment which is trying to unpack the reasons for the lower fertility, which is essentially, are women choosing not to have children because of the economic penalties? Is that the yeah. source of low fertility? Right, I'd like to speak to that. Yeah, so what happens is, is when, when a country doesn't make it possible or easy enough for a woman to both work and have children, what happens is that they have to choose one or the other. And that ends up lowering both the fertility rate and the labor force participation because the one segment of the women go off and stay at work. The ones who choose to have babies don't have extra babies to account for the ones that went to work, right? So they both go down. It's a, it's a really big, it's a big problem. It's a big issue. I think um, younger people who are listening will also know that one of the things that contributes mightily to this problem is the high cost of living. Uh, which means that you have to have two incomes to afford children uh, at, at the very least. And that also has an impact. And still on the theme of fertility, which is obviously quite incredibly important, um, a comment from an, an audience member, Cesara Lydia, who says, do you think as society ages, there's going to be a backlash against women and their rights because of the association of quality and high economic activity with low fertility? I think that's a possibility. I'm not, I don't think, okay, two parts. I don't think that it's likely only in the sense of, I think too few people have made that connection. Uh, and and um, and so to have it, 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 there would have to be quite a lot more awareness. I do think that there is a risk that some countries will get into a mode where they think they have to raise the fertility and they try to do this by force. They try to do this by uh, outlawing abortion, by uh, outlawing contraceptives, uh, even by um, the, the, the worst case uh, example is uh, Romania in the 1960s tried something like this and they did things like they had forcible pelvic examinations at, at employees place of work. It, it, and, and it is quite, we know that when that happens, it's quite dangerous and it's quite, um, damaging long term to the society. Um, but um, yeah, it could happen. We've got a lot of really right wing authoritarian groups coming up around the world. And this would be the kind of thing you might see from them. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna move us to a set of questions around sort of more sort of economy questions and, and gender. So just firstly, I think a very nice is simple question in relation to a book from Helen, which is, can you give us the definition of a double X economy? Okay, so it's, 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 it's simply the economy of women as they are currently configured with a certain specific set of constraints that puts then out a specific pattern of inequality. So it's women 
their mechanisms of, of exclusion and the pattern that that produces. Thank you. Okay, and then so peers ask, as GDP does not measure a lot of women's work and contribution, can you suggest a best, better measure that we could actually use instead? Okay, so this is this is a very big issue right now, and some feminist economists are wanting to add a value uh, to attach a value to to basically uh, impute a monetary value to unpaid work. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm okay with that. I think that's fine. And I can see why they would want to do that. So because they think it would be more valued. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that's going to be true. Um, there's another uh, suggestion that that um, maybe that women get paid for this and I think that uh, women do so much that there's you know the households I live in would not be able to afford to pay them the market rate for what they do it, it would be impractical um, it's my own feeling that unpaid work while it is absolutely essential has issues of women's unfreedom attached to it so much that what I would rather see is accommodations made to make it more possible for women to work and also perhaps to provide social safety nets for those who choose not to. Um, I would be in favor of some kind of not universal basic income because I think they should be paid more than what everybody gets by default, um, but some kind of thing like that. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then also sort of still in the sort of economics and relating to microloans. Um, Erica Town asks, are microloans an important and successful strategy for supporting women? Okay, so that's another yes and no question. When I first got into this work, micro, the microcredit revolution was in high gear. And um, there were two things that characterized it at the beginning that were quite good and we still know are good and one of them is that it gives credit availability to women uh, particularly in places where they did not have access to credit before because they were excluded from the money system okay the other thing is the way it was organized was in groups of women who met privately and this allowed them to make their own decisions without interference from men and to build solidarity among themselves and that has turned out to be really important Organizing those women's economic groups is very powerful for poverty alleviation, very powerful and very powerful for women's rights as well. Now, the big problem with it has turned out to be the um, high interest rates. Um, they um, are at least 25%, sometimes as high as 50 or 100%. They're usurious. Uh, and particularly if women are not particularly numerate, um, they can really get caught in a debt, debt spiral. And that happens in particular if the microfinance institution that's loaning to them does not provide some kind of um, business idea or business management or something that helps her do more than just take out the money. Um, um, it was interesting in the last time I went to Bangladesh, the, the, what the women were in the rural areas were doing is that they were buying plane tickets for their husbands to go to the Middle East and work and send back um, remittances. And of course, there are all kinds of problems with the men going and doing that. On the other hand, it, 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 if you want to just be really crass about it, it was a wise investment in a capital asset to do that. Okay, thank you. So I'm now going to move us on to a slightly different, different tack of questions. Um, and um, so I'm going to take the comment from John Izzet, um, John, who says, um, I completely buy your argument and what you're saying. The problem seems to me to be men. If you were to try to convince a resisting man coming out with naturalistic claims and nonsense about men, always as more powerful, etc., what would be your most powerful argument? I ask because I want to use them. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So this is the most, I I'm, I'm want to make sure I've understood the question. Um, so then this person thinks that the, pro that the resistance, the problem is men. And then what kind of argument you would use? Yeah. Okay, all right. Oh, this is a great question. Okay, <laughs> so we make these arguments mostly in terms of GDP, okay? And the reason for that, and I explain this in the book, is that when this movement first started, you had to be convincing finance ministers and old style economists that it was a good idea and they did not care 
about social justice for women, but it rang their bells if we could talk about GDP. So some of this has been a rhetorical strategy, pure and simple, and it has worked, which is, which is great. Uh, there are all kinds of problems with it because GDP doesn't measure some things that we need to be looking at. But, and I, I say in the book that uh, just the unfettered chasing of GDP is, is the defining characteristic of patriarch, patriarchal economics and we should not be going there. We should just not be going there. Um, as far as then the, the other part of the question, and actually I'm pretty pretty harsh about this in the book, um, is that I think we need to start being realistic in calling men out for the way they contribute to these problems. And I think it is possible to do that once you understand that in most of the world even, the majority of men are on board with gender equality. In the Western nations in particular, I've seen measures as high as 98%. Uh, low, lowest I think I've seen is about 70. So you've got, you've got 70 to 100% of the men totally on board, totally think that the job's not finished, will answer the question, yes, I need to help it so that it will occur. So what we need to be doing now, it's not just assuming that all the men are you know, in a defensive mode because that's really not accurate. What we need to do is to look at those men who are answering those questions, no, I'm not on board with gender equality. And we need to start getting real hard nosed about what's wrong with those men because that's really out of step with cultural values of all sorts. And it speaks of some uh, data, uh, there's data on men who feel that way and it, it tends to track with violence, it tends to track with substance abuse, it tracks with wife beating, it, tra it tracks with racism, it tracks with homophobia. These are not, these are people who are not okay. In my view, it is wrong to treat it as a political position. It's more accurately treated as a pathology. And so my feeling is, is that we need to start talking about that, not only because we're not gonna solve this problem if we keep pretending these guys are okay, because of course, the other thing is because they do tend to be bullies, they're very often in positions of authority uh, over other men as well as women. And, uh, and so I think, I really think that we're just gonna have to get serious about the, the real resistance here is a marginal group and a dangerous group and that we don't have to put up with it because if we join up the good guys and the women, there are so many more of us than there are of them. And we just need to say, look, this is where the society wants to go and you are in the way. Okay, so that's my, that's my argument. I hope that works for the questioner. I think that was a good reply. Uh, there was another, uh, another audience member who put a question in there actually seconding, mainly seconding John's um, question that I just gave to you. And his comment was, how on earth do we get men to give up some ground? Um, it doesn't seem to be possible for women to just take what is theirs. And of course, many women don't accept that there is an outrageous imbalance or even in developing countries, a realize how poor their lot is. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of strategies, um, what, would you, what would you suggest for trying to help women to get a fairer share? A fair of share. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one thing is, is, um, is to realize uh, that when we need their, they need to come into their own power in the sense of even recognizing that they have power. The fact that, that women are contributing 40% of GDP is a bit of power. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. That should, there should be a way of using that. Now, in the, um, in the book, I suggest this thing called the 80% Christmas, all right? And, and basically I came up with this in order to illustrate the kinds of things we could think about doing, okay? There are other things I'm sure. And, and, and sort of a 21st century strategy, not, you know, I mean, marching in strikes, I think it's just kind of over and, and it never worked for women, the strikes anyway. So, um, and revolution doesn't either, by the way, and we can address that later, but, um, all right, in this situation, you have to understand that <clears throat> around the world, somewhere between two thirds and 85% of consumer purchases are made by women. In the developed countries, it's closer to 75 to 85%, all right? And that they command more than their own income because they bring in all the household income and then they deploy it for household purposes. And this is true across really most product categories. It's also important to understand that every culture has a holiday 
around which the entire economy spins. And in the West, it's Christmas. And if Christmas retail is off, even by four or five percent, uh, it's it spells disaster for the economy the rest of the year. So it's very powerful. And for holidays, women control basically a hundred percent. And everybody, it, 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 or at least they say the women will know that if the women don't make or buy the stuff to have the holiday, it does not happen. So women just absolutely rule in the consumption domain, but particularly when it comes to holidays. So. If you were to have a campaign that said, all right, this is the 80% Christmas, and this year I'm just gonna spend 80% of what I spent last year. And if you did that over, the, over a significant swath of the population, you would be making a meaningful threat. And if you said, okay, and then the next year, I'm gonna spend 80% of the 80%, and the next year it's gonna be the 80% of the 80% of the 80% until the gender pay gap is closed. To me, that is that's that could work. That could work. And it would be a lot of fun. We could, we could take pictures of each other, you know, cooking cheap turkeys and things. It, it could be fun putting them out on, on uh, social media. And I think we've already shown that women can organize like this and they can organize around the world from, for example, the, uh, the 2017 March after Donald Trump was elected, which went on everywhere. We can do this and we can do it even on short notice. And what I've suggested in the book is we go from the 80 cent percent Christmas to the 80 percent Lunar New Year and then the 80 percent Diwali and the 80 percent Ramadan and so that it can move around the world. Uh, it's something that everybody can participate in because there are none among us who couldn't afford to spend less on the holidays. We all can afford to spend less and it's a private decision so that you can't have the retaliation that you have for example in a strike. So this is the kind of thing, maybe not just this, but the kind of thing I would like for people to start thinking about is to be more creative about what they do in a protest. Okay, that's very interesting. Is, 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 is the individual acting in a sort of in relation to consumption rather than in terms of production, yeah. uh, which is an interesting. Okay, so there's, I've got a lot of really excellent questions here and I'm afraid I'm not gonna do the audience justice in terms of asking them all, but one I'd like to give you. So it, essentially we, we observe inequality across the world in, in, for women. Um, and the question from the, the audience member is, wouldn't it be better for women to wait until a worldwide movement to upend the current system, which is intri intrinsically inequitable, can be mounted and replaced with one that is fair to everybody, not just women? Uh, yeah, okay, so this is a problematic. Um, first, I do want to point out that in every group, ethnic, class, race, religious, in every group that we know about, the women are less economically autonomous than the men. The, men, the women are disadvantaged. And so what that means, if you start lifting uh, the economic constraints on women, there will be a positive ripple across the entire population. It will not just be, people just tend to think of, well, you have, you know, women and then you have the poor. Well, half the poor are women, okay? That more than half the poor are women. Um, and so, so it's the kind of thing, and it would be, some, and the thing of it is, is that because all the constraints are the same, you can do it, whammo, and have that kind of a, a, an efficient uh, impact. Um, and like I said, it, it's been already proven to be the most effective poverty fighter. And it is a re redistribution of wealth after all. It's just not the way we normally think of it. Um, as far as waiting, all right, this is, this is, this happens a lot, okay? That people say, oh, you know, well, you should wait. Well, that's because that's coming from a different agenda. That's coming from an agenda where you're waiting for the other half of the population. The other half of the population is male. All right. That to me is like saying in America that the black people should wait until the white people have it good. Okay. And that's not okay with me. And it basically says that we have to solve every other problem in, in the world first, and then we will solve the women's problems. So the women are not as important as any other problem. And they are, I'm sorry, but this data shows that they are one of our most, if not, if not our most important problem. So it's completely right in my view to start there, you're going to have a, huge, a bigger impact and it's just as righteous. All right, finally, when is that revolution going to happen? I'm saying it's not coming anytime soon. 
And so it, that's just, it's basically a way, it's used as a way just to block reforms on behalf of women, to say, we're gonna wait, and that means you're not gonna get this. And that's what it means in, in practical terms as how it works out. So, um, so now this is not to say I'm not aware of other inequalities, I very much am. And I also think that, that I do agree that the current system is fundamentally and intrinsically inequitable and perpetuates those inequities if it's not um, controlled. Um, I do also though um, think that people need to be aware that the history of, of revolution is that it doesn't turn out the way the people who started it think it's going to. That is very, very rare. And it normally, it normally devolves into a reign of terror and is normally taken over by conservative elements, often religious elements. And when that happens, the women are the ones who are hurt. And even when it's more successful than that, for example, the Bolshevik revolution of the early 20th century, what happens is that after it's over, the men say, oh no, we need to attend to the larger issue, the larger issue being their well-being, um, and the women are going to have to wait, okay? And they quash feminist uh, speech and feminist um, organizing. Uh, so it does not turn out well. Um, those kinds of revolutions yeah, I mean, it's a betrayal. It's, it's a betrayal. This is, there's no reason to think that that's going to help women any more than any of the rest of it. Okay, so I can see time is moving on a bit. So I, I'm going to give you my last question. And apologies that I haven't taken all the other questions, which I think were very excellent. But hopefully we've captured some of the answers in, in the other ones. Um, but as I said at the start, your, your book is a, is a call to action. And you've given us one nice example in terms of the 80% on, on holiday, on spending on holidays from a consumption point of view. But we have a nice question from Jennifer who describes herself as a millennial woman in the USA. And would just like you to give you a couple of more examples on things that she might do in terms of personal actions to, um, to effectively participate in the dismantling of these systems of gender inequality. Right, okay, thank you very much, um, millennial in the USA. Um, there are in the book some fairly general ideas like about on social media, on charity and this kind of thing, but I would like to speak more specifically to the United States if I may. Um, what we really need there is to start teaching, and, and this is true all over the world, but there's a moment right now with Biden, the Biden administration that I think that this could be done effectively and with impact. We need to start teaching both our leaders and other women to think of themselves in economic terms. They're in the habit of thinking that women's rights is equal pay and abortion and that's it, okay? And as it is right now, for example, the Roberts Court, the Supreme Court over there, uh, over here, um, has enacted, has made decisions in the last 20 years that effectively negate the employment rights that women won in the 1970s and that needs to be fixed and there's all kinds of other uh and i talk a little bit about this in the book like for example the student debt crisis um women hold two-thirds of student debt and the reason is because they have to get more education to have the same jobs men do all right so that if they're going to forgive student debt they can't say oh only fifty thousand dollars because that's discrimination against women you see what I mean? Because they have more debt and they're going to pay it back at a lower salary. So I would just say, okay, so advocacy and articulation of things that are more economic so that people start thinking of it differently is what I would say. And, and there's a degree to which certainly in the UK, the same, same kind of thinking, maybe different issues, but the same kind of thinking. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think given the time, we're probably going to have to stop there. Um, as I said, there were many more questions. I think we could have, could have gone on for much longer, but I, I know we have to stop for, for the time. So I just really would like to very much thank Linda for spending your time with us today, hearing about her book and also for her book. So having read the book, it was um, a great pleasure to, to have the book and to be able to read it. And I can see that Martin's putting up the slide there for your book for us. Um, as I said, thank you very much to Linda for her time and thank you very much to our audience. Um, the recording of this event will be available on York Ideas YouTube channel, which can be accessed by typing York Ideas YouTube into Google, um, but it will probably be a couple of days before it will be there. Um, it's 
who said, if you would like to purchase a copy of Linda's book, The Double X Economy with signed book plates, they will be available from the university's partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. And for more information, that is on the screen there for you. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's event, which I very much hope you did, um, you may also be interested in some of our other events taking place over the fortnight as part of our open lecture program, the details of which, which can be found, uh, I think, are, are on the screen at the moment as well. Um, and um, we very much, the University of York very much hopes that you will continue to be engaged with York ideas through, through our open lecture series. We have a website, york.ac.uk slash events for full details of all events in the open lecture program. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on these events and continue the conversation using the hashtag um, York ideas. So just to conclude then, um, to say thank you to our audience, special thank you to our speaker, Linda, for her time today and for speaking with us and to wish you all a good evening and stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>